check one, check two, check one, check two. And Mark. Hello, my name is Benjamin Bravo. I am a researcher for the Friends of St. Paul. Although canon law is not my chosen discipline and I have no credentials in the field, I do hold a Bachelor of Arts from the University of Dallas and have studied bioethics and theology at the graduate level. I was asked by my fellow members of the Friends of St. Paul to provide a cursory introduction to and explanation of the topic of canon law in order to offer a bit of footing to those of us who find all this entirely new in light of the All Things New initiative in the Archdiocese of St. Louis. To do so, I will answer the following questions. What is canon law? Where does it come from? What are its functions and purposes? To whom does it apply? And how can we make use of it in our current circumstance? While this last question is the most pressing of the five, I should answer the preceding four in order to give the necessary context that answer requires. Now, of all the things I am about to say in this video, there are really only two that I ask you to remember as the most important. I will make a point of highlighting them when they come up, so without further preamble I'll turn to the first question. What is canon law? Canon law is the body of norms, rules, administrative acts, and statutes which governs the community of the Catholic Church as she lives out her divine commission and sacred doctrines. For the Latin Catholic Church, this body of law is collected in the 1983 Code of Canon Law. Canon law encompasses all the laws of the Church, except the liturgical laws. In plain terms, it is the framework for all rules about the following. Sacramental discipline, that is, marriages and annulments, worthy reception of the Eucharist, frequency of confession, who may present themselves for entrance to the seminary and for ordination to the clerical state, etc. Rules about donations of goods, like money and contracts, properties and other necessary things for the works of the Church. Requirements for education and formation in the faith. The lives of priests and clergy, their rights and obligations. Who can and cannot hold offices in the Church, and of what kinds there are the structural organization of the people of the Church, including parishes, dioceses, and wider networks like the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, and the rights and obligations of all the baptized. Where does canon law come from? Canon law is the oldest continuously used legal system in the world. The term canon law itself goes a long way in explaining its own origin. Canon comes from the Greek word kanonos, which first appears in Homer's Iliad, referring to the stave supports in warrior's shields. It eventually came to mean a rod for ruling or measuring, and by the Roman Empire meant a rule, list, or precept. Thus, ecumenical councils, beginning with the Council of Jerusalem, issued binding laws as canons, a practice in force up to the First Vatican Council in 1870. Likewise, we speak of the canon of Scripture as that list of books judged as truly containing divine revelation. Law, though Germanic in origin, has two Latin equivalents, lex, which refers to a particular statute, for example, a speed limit, and ius, which is a law in the thick philosophic sense, or as a whole body of norms, for example, the traffic code, or the notion of automobile regulation itself. As these mixed Greco-Roman roots suggest, canon law arose in the context of the early church in the Greco-Roman world of the 1st and 2nd centuries AD. Particular precepts can be found in sources as old as the Didache, dated to 70 AD, but canon law really came into its own as Christianity gained acceptance and patronage within the empire. Church law developed idiosyncratically. Rome, Constantinople, Antioch, Carthage, and Toledo were all early centers of canon law, each developing their bodies of law differently. The most common reference point, aside from the early councils, was the canons of the Holy Apostles in the Apostolic Constitutions, which dates to the last quarter of the 4th century. 
In the 6th century, Emperor Justinian's reforming spirit swept up much of the Eastern Church in its current, such that civil law and ecclesial law were standardized and overhauled in much the same way. The civil codex and ecclesial nomocanons cooperated with each other. Indeed, Justinian's codex is a prime example of the baptism of the Roman legal tradition, which sees many Roman imperial legal customs in use in the Church up to our own time. I should pause here to note the drastic gulf between our general preconceptions of law as shaped by the USA's common law tradition inherited from the English on the one hand, and the nature of law within the Catholic Church on the other. Of the two things I have asked you to remember, this is the first. I will condense this difference into three points of comparison. Our secular common law tradition is far more democratic, more often than not sets the different powers of government, that is the executive, legislative, and judicial, in competition with each other, and safeguards stability by appealing to legal precedent. Divine law, a source of canon law, does not separate the powers of government within those who hold the highest positions in a diocese or the church. Therefore, canon law is fundamentally monarchic and hierarchical, far more interested in centralizing the governing powers in the service of a paternal authority, and safeguards stability by subjecting itself to the church's sacred tradition and sacred doctrine. To understand legal and administrative procedures and culture in the Catholic Church, we have to set aside some, if not most, of our instinctive American notions of law and governance. The Catholic Church organizes her teachings and legal system under the principles of divine law. Because the principles of divine law are more important than statutory human law, and because modern European nationalism, so often solidified by a national legal code, did not arise until recently in our history, the Catholic Church did not develop a standardized and fully articulated code until 1917. Instead, scholars and churchmen, often at the behest of the papacy or local needs, compiled lists of individual laws and papal decisions called decretals into collections. Gratian, in the 11th century, is called the father of canon law for his development of jurisprudence specific to church law, which he drew out of the many collections of his day. As universities expanded from their origins as cathedral schools, the law, both civil and ecclesial, was one of their primary foci. However, under the pressures of the modernizing world, in the wake of the social, political, and spiritual revolutions of the 17 and 1800s, and because the body of law was then around some 10,000 canons long, the Church began to develop a standardized code at the turn of the last century. This code was finished and promulgated by Pope Benedict XV in 1917. The Second Vatican Council called for a full-scale overhaul of this code in recognition of further social developments and political realities which had made certain portions of the previous code obsolete. This was completed in 1983 and promulgated by Pope St. John Paul II in the same year. It remains in force to this day, barring, among other things, some of the penal law which Pope Francis has stiffened with a new Book VI in response to the sex abuse scandal and other crises. However, the primacy of principles remains in force in the Code of Canon Law. Two effects follow from a legal system based primarily on principles of law rather than statutes. First, the law itself is streamlined. Compare the Latin Church's nearly 1,752 canons or laws to the huge collection of U.S. federal statutes. Second, such a system addresses controversy far more flexibly. It is this flexibility which extends the rights of the faithful to challenge the harmful actions of bishops. This brings us right along to our third question, what does canon law do? That is, what are the functions and purposes of canon law? It performs these following functions. First, it illustrates and safeguards the rights and obligations of all baptized members of the church. Second, it defines and protects the rights, duties, and powers of those in authority in the Church, most notably clerics. Third, it provides norms for the protection and sacramental integrity and provision of sacraments and sacred places of worship. Fourth, 
It regulates the use of goods for the mission of the church and her members, for example, buildings, donations, properties, etc. Fifth, it regulates the provision and necessity of education and formation of all peoples in the faith. Sixth, it gives norms on the states of life and roles in the society of the church, for example, professed religious, married and unmarried lame men and women, and those in the clerical life. Seventh, it gives administrative norms in the governance of the church and appeals against administrative decisions. Eighth, it provides penal law for recourse against injustice and abuses of authority in the form of violations of canon law called delicts. While this is a non-exhaustive list, it is a perfectly solid foundation for our present concern. To whom does canon law apply? It applies to all the baptized. Across the board, baptism entails membership in the society of the Catholic Church. Now, not every member of the Church has the same roles, and with different roles come different rights and responsibilities. Thus, clergy are subject to some sections of the Code and the duties therein, and likewise enjoy some rights that the lay faithful do not. Conversely, parents also enjoy some rights and face some responsibilities that clerics do not, and are thus subject to other portions of the Code. Please note well that because the Church takes seriously her claim of being the one true Church of Christ, those Christians not in full communion with Rome do enjoy a certain protection, and the law evidences a real concern for their spiritual well-being. Finally, if a law is a purely divine law, and is a statute such as one man or one woman can enter marriage, then it binds everyone, Catholic, baptized, or not. How can we make use of canon law now? This most pressing question can best be answered by drawing your attention to a number of our specific rights and duties as members of the lay faithful. I have drawn the following list from A Passion for Justice, an introductory guide to the Code of Canon Law written by G. J. Woodall. His full list will be available online. I would like to note that every time the Church defines a right, she defines a companion duty. Thus, we have a right to live in communion with the Church, but a duty to preserve that same communion. We have a right to spread the gospel to all people, but a duty to strive to ensure that the gospel in fact reaches all people. We have a right to make known and to have met by our pastors our spiritual needs, but a duty to give them Christian obedience and to the teachings of the Church and all legitimate rules of our pastors. We have a right to make known our views to our pastors for the good of the Church, and this is also a duty. We have a right to promote and support apostolic action on our own initiative, but a duty to obtain consent from proper Church authorities to use the title Catholic in the name of any such initiative. We have a right to retain a good re reputation free from unlawful harm, but a duty not to harm any other's reputation. Likewise, we have a right to privacy, and a duty not to violate any other's right to privacy. We have a right to vindicate and defend our other rights before a tribunal of the Church, but a duty to use the process provided by the Church herself for just such conflicts. We have a right to exercise our religion in accordance with the divine law of God, but a duty to provide for the needs of the Church and to promote social justice and provide from our own resources for the needs of the poor. Therefore, we, the friends of St. Paul, are well within our rights and obligations to take the actions which we have. We have taken special notice in exercising our rights to communicate our views to our pastors, each of them from our local parish priest to His Excellency the Archbishop of St. Louis, and now to His Holiness Pope Francis. We have acted with as much transparency as possible, keeping in mind everyone's right to privacy. The administrative actions we have taken stem from our freedom to vindicate and defend our rights before the courts of the Church. Likewise, we have followed through with our obligation to inform those who have empowered Mr. Joseph Granicke to serve as procurator of those administrative actions which we have taken in their name. We and core teams like ours 
have committed to following the protocols developed by Philip Gray and the St. Joseph Foundation precisely because of their clarity, orthodoxy, and fidelity to both the Magisterium and the Catholic Church's own legal code. The procurator mandate process itself is rooted in Canons 1481 to 1490 of the 1983 Code. With that, I would like to leave you with this final thought. The entire Code of Canon Law, all 1,752 canons, is reducible to and in the service of one law. This is the second thing I ask you to remember, and out of everything I have said, this is the most important. If you recall nothing else, remember this. The salvation of souls is the supreme law of the Church. The salvation of souls is the supreme law of the Church. Everything she does, every canon, rite, and obligation tends towards this goal. Our gravest concern is the friends of St. Paul. Our sum total motivation for our work, our devotion to the cause of preserving St. Paul as an independent parish, aims at precisely the same mission here in our own city of St. Paul, Missouri. If you've lasted this long, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I direct you to the frequently asked questions, which are embedded either in this blog post or this video's description or pinned comment. Thank you very much for your time, and may God bless you.